let's say in the last two years, this technology has evolved from being what you call rapid prototyping, so for building prototypes, to rapid manufacturing. The technology has evolved to the level where you can get full strength components out of this, so components that can be used as the product. Now, the other implication of these technologies, they, what, what the, the catchphrase is, you get complexity for free. Doesn't matter how complex your part is, it doesn't cost you anything more because it's printed on the go. Now, a good example of that, there's an Italian company called uh, Tecnologio Trevisa that make high-end sunglasses. So these are fairly high-end designer sunglasses. They do a run of 500 sunglasses, and that's the end of that run. Now, one of the things they do is they customize each pair of sunglasses to your needs. They laser scan your face and customize the bridge of the sunglasses to fit your face perfectly so they don't slip off. So this is a simple example of what's called mass customization, where you can make every product as a mass manufacturing process, but every one of those products is different. This is still in its infancy, but it is being done today. Another good example of where, it's being, where the mass customization comes into is medical use. So currently now we can print out a hip replacement that fits you perfectly. So in the, I hesitate to say the old technology, because it's not old technology, it's still being used today, but the conventional technology, I think you get to choose between sort of small, medium, and large, or the doctor chooses for you, and it works. It's better than nothing, but it's not perfect. And if I understand the, the, the statistic correctly, if you, if you have a hip replacement, you often need three within your lifetime, because they tend to wear out. With these technologies, they can do an MRI of the good hip, assuming there is a good hip, mirror it, and then print out a titanium hip replacement that fits you perfectly. Now, it's never that simple, because if the, hits wo hit, the hip is worn, they mirror it, and then they have to modify it, but it's all done in a virtual world. They then hit the print button, and it prints it out in titanium, again, layer by layer by layer, until you have a hip, a hip joint made specially for you that fits you perfectly. And for those of you who want to have a look afterwards, this is a little bit of titanium bone replacement. So it's sort of a scaffold structure made out of titanium that you print out in the shape of the bone that's missing, and the bone grows into the titanium, so it's called osteointegration, where your bone becomes part of the titanium, which means you get a very lightweight, full strength, full bone replacement eventually. So those are a few examples of where these technologies are being used today. And to me, when you think about a country like New Zealand, one of the big opportunities for New Zealand is not in competing with warehouse quality products, you know, the $2 plastic toy. To me, one of the opportunities for New Zealand is to compete in that high value niche product. And these technologies tend to play into that quite well because niche products tend to be high value. Therefore, you can afford to use these technologies as part of the manufacturing process. Now, like I said, this is new. The whole full strength product where your metal parts or your plastic parts are as good as injection molded ones or cast parts would be is new. It's only in the last two years that they've really achieved that. So I can predict that in the next two, three, five years, you're going to see a plethora of applications where they start to use these technologies to manufacture your products for you. So I guess I'm still just looking at the timing on that. Um, to tell you, to, just to give you some idea of where these technologies are heading. Um, one very nice example, which is essentially the same technology as this, where you extrude a material out of a nozzle and put it down layer by layer. This is the University of Southern California. They're using this same technology to print houses. So instead of printing in plastic, they print on a much larger scale in concrete. So they have a large machine, literally the size of this room, which is an XY moving gantry, and they have a concrete hose, and it prints out, again, layer by layer, follows the contours of the walls, jumps up, does the next layer, and prints out the walls of your house as you go. Now, I'm saying this is a future technology. Currently, they can print the walls. So they've actually got very successful machine that can print the concrete as you go. What they can't quite do yet, and what they're working on, is things like electrics, things like plumbing. So how do you do that at the same time as the house is printing? They're not quite there yet, but working on it. Another thing they can't do quite yet is when you get to the top of the doorway or the top of the window, it's an air gap. If you try to print concrete on there, it's just going to drop. So you've got to put a lintel above the door and the window. Now, sounds relatively simple. You can use robots to pick up a beam and put it above the door or the window. But now you start to think about the logistics of this. You've got a machine that's moving all over the place. At the same time, you've got a couple of robots fighting each other all to put beams in place. 
a lot more complex than it sounds. So this, these are areas they're currently working on in terms of how do we solve these problems. And if we can, you can imagine a row of houses, particularly for developing countries, where they come out, they, the truck comes out to the construction site, wheels out the gantry, prints out a row of houses. Now, each one of those houses could be unique and completely different. You could snick your house off the internet plan, say, I want to add a room here, move a window here, hit that order now button, as we often do on the internet, and the next day a truck comes up to your site, prints the house you designed. And you think about the implications of that are quite far-reaching. And there's also implications that we can talk about later in terms of what happens to the builders and so on. Um, that's one I can't quite answer myself right now. Um, another area that to me is hugely exciting is bioprinting. Same technologies, but printing with biological materials. So I talked about earlier, we can already do quite easily hip replacements, that kind of things. What we can also do now is, and this is Wake Forest University in America, they can essentially, I mean, I'll sound like I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. They can print out organs. Again, layer by layer by layer, they print out an organ. Now, when I say organs, I exaggerate a little bit. They can currently only do simple organs. There's about 13 organs they can do. Things like, on animals, quite a few heart valves, bits and pieces like that. For humans, the only one they currently do is they print out bladders. So if you need a bladder replacement, essentially what they do is they take the stem cells from your bladder. Now, I'm not quite comfortable with the biology here, but as I understand it, the stem cells from your bladder are pre-programmed to be a bladder, which means if you put them in the right configuration in the right environment, they become a bladder. So what they do is they essentially use, simplest description is they use inkjet technology. So your, your inkjet printer at home, that inkjets ink on a sheet of paper in the shape of a letter one, two, three, whatever it is. They use the same technology, but they replace the ink with the stem cells and then print out the bladder layer by layer by layer by layer, then put it in the right environment for, I think it's about a week or two weeks before it becomes a bladder. It's not perfect yet, but they are working on it. And this is actually currently being done in the States where they are taking these bladders and implanting them into patients. And of course, because the, part, the body parts are made with your own stem cells, there's no rejection, which is another big advantage of this. Now, I think my prediction is we're still, is we're still a few years away from complex organs. So you can imagine, but you can very well imagine that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, you need a new kidney and you can get yourself a new kidney printed from your own stem cells. Now the reason things like kidneys are much more difficult is the materials are complex. It's not a single material, whereas a bladder is largely a single material. And the same, skin they can already print today. So this is almost science fiction, but it's not science fiction, it's happening today. I mean, even here in New Zealand at AUT, at AUT we are doing some research on bioprinting. We're printing I guess the simplest description I can use is pregnancy tests for disease. So these are little diagnostic tests printed on paper that you don't need microscopes or special equipment to read. You have your little test strip, you put in your drops of blood, you rinse it out in a solution, and it comes out in text saying, yes, you have this disease, or smiley face, or whatever you want. Because we're printing with inkjet technology, we can print pretty much anything we want on the paper. So this is, you can, again, you can imagine for developing world, countries where they don't have the technology, the infrastructure to do complex tests, this is a new way of being able to do this kind of very low cost diagnostic testing. Um, how am I doing, doing for time? Ooh, yes, okay. I think the thing I'll leave you with, this is my prediction, and we're not far away from this. This is, my prediction is 10 years from now, everybody will have one of these machines at home. Now, I, I may be a bit optimistic on the 10 years, but um, this is an example. This is the first machine that prints multiple materials at the same time. So it can print, for example, in rubber and plastic at the same time. One of the things it can do is what's called digital materials, where it creates its own new materials by using a combination of the base materials. Now, my prediction is that you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, depending how optimistic you are, you will have one of these machines at home when you need a new toothbrush instead of going to Food Town to buy a new toothbrush, you'll probably feed your old toothbrush in one end of the machine, it'll recycle all the material, there's most likely gonna be some kind of a laser scanner on the machine that'll scan your hand, your mouth, and it'll print you out a new toothbrush, customized to your liking with the bristle hairs, just the hardness you like them, a handle that fits your hand perfectly with a Hello Kitty logo on it, because that's what you like, and 
this will become a form of home mass manufacturing where you'll be able to order parts. So what you'll be buying now will not be the parts, but the design. So over the in internet, you will order designs with the possibility of customizing them yourself, and you will be making the parts yourself. So this is a bit of a revolution in terms of how we live. So I think I might have sort of run out of time possibly, so I might leave it at that. Uh, yeah.